welcome to SVG TV News for Tuesday, January 24th, 2023. I'm Rochelle Batiste with the details. Director of the National Insurance Services, Stuart Haynes, continues to stress the importance of Social Security, not only for retirement, but also for a variety of risk factors that may prevent an individual from living a quality life. Speaking on the issue on NBC Radio today, Haynes said Social Security is very important from an income protection standpoint. If we look at a worker and we look at whilst working he's earning, if there are any incident that lead to a loss of income, let us say sickness, let us say maternity, employment, injury, the Social Security replaced your income. On old age, we replaced the income. So it's sort of a social safety net. It's actually a mechanism that the society provides for individuals and families to protect them against financial hardship owing to those contingencies. The NIS executive director said Social Security also contributes to national and social economic development. For instance, we have over $267 million in the local economy investing in significant sort of a capital project. Social Security is also one of the major players on the regional stock exchange market. And in the local financial market, when we look at banks, credit unions, we have over a hundred and something million invested in those organizations. And also we broaden our mandate to actually contribute to social development. We support the health sector, we support the housing sector, and we engage in poverty alleviation project. I mean, the last time I was here, I was here talking about the temporary unemployment benefits. Yes, I remember that. That is where a significant proportion of our workers were affected by COVID-19. It actually was a recession. And what we did, it provide income for those persons who lost the income as a result of COVID-19. And for those members, those were contributors of NIS, and we're talking about 1,200 Vincentians. And the cost of that program is about three million. So we are integral with regards to one, an individual income security and national economic and social development. Very, very critical. On the temporary benefits provided by the NIS to a number of unemployed persons here as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, Haynes hailed the support program as a success. Initially, it was for six months. By the time of rolling back the program, the economic situation worsened. So what we did, we extend for further three months, up to March, 31st March 2021, because persons were feeling the pain. But again, we had a balance between our financial sustainability, then our social solidarity in terms of providing. That's why it had to be temporary, targeted, and transparent. So it was a huge success. And I mean, I went to the World Social Security Conference and I had to speak on that, not for only St. Vincent, but for the regional social security system. Almost six of us provided temporary unemployment benefit because the, 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 the issue is that only Barbados and Bahamas, the only two regional social security systems that have it as part of the benefit package. So it was a success because it gives us a sense of, I mean, the need of that protection in the in event of unemployment. And the global statistics was about 19% of workers globally were covered for the unemployment risk. So that's, a, that's one of the most undercovered area and where social security globally need to put time and effort to expand. The NIS director also used the opportunity to encourage young people to take Social Security seriously and be part of the NIS, which he said is one way of securing their future. Our realities are that when we look at persons who receive in pensions from NIS, we noted out of our 9,363 pensioners, almost 5,000 plus receive NIS as the only source of income. So the employers do not provide an occupational pension plan. And for reasons 
other reasons they may not have personal savings. So the only source of income in retirement is social security. And it's best for us to start saving at a young age. You benefit from the principle of accumulation and also compound interest. So you have longer years in terms of contributing to NIS and what would happen, your pension percentage would be higher. Because for instance, we had persons retiring at 60. When we compute the pension, the pension fell below the minimum weekly of $70. So we had to top up from that population at 9,300, about 1,300%. Because the pension fell below the minimum and we had to top them up. And probably because their contribution history was short, also low wages and so forth. So it's important for you to start early. And we show our investment in the youths by our participation in the National Student Loan Program. Because it's important for us to invest in the competitiveness of our local economy. Because at the end of the day, that's our future contribution base. And we do other programs with regards to the youth. So it's important that we raise this consciousness of savings. And retirement planning is three legs. What the NIS provide? The basic. Then try to put something aside for rainy days, your own personal savings. Then in some cases, employers will, will, will provide. And president of the teachers' union, Oswald Robinson, says the government has a lot on its hands to deal with, including unemployment, poverty, and pension reform. He was speaking on the Teachers Talk program on the radio on Sunday, looking at issues in relation to school visits, pension reform, and other union-related matters. If you're not employing enough people or uh, creating the environment for the private sector to attract younger people into employment, then the NIS would suffer. Right. And would Less contribution. Suffer from underemployment. And then there's well. also the issue of underemployment. Yeah. Right. Then there's the issue of poverty. If more people is in poverty and the government have to find a way to help them. They themselves are more or less dependent on the system. Right. It means that those who are working have to bear the burden of those who are not working. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of that under the NIS. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <coughs> non contributing And then I'm hearing about the national debt. Right. Keep escalating. You understand? And we have to look at these issues. The government has to come clear and straight. It's not just going to the house and say, oh, it's a border on us, but you're not telling us what was your connection with the NIS. Mm -hmm. and how they got there. You understand? Mm -hmm. You have to come clear and straight. And <laughs> remember, they want to make it mandatory. Right. For those people who are self-employed out there. Mm -hmm. You're trying your own little thing. What about the people walking in the market, the vendors? They're coming at you again. Yes. Yes. The taxi men out there, the, yeah. the minibus, yeah. minibuses. They're coming at you. Mm -hmm. The farmers who are self-employed, the fishermen, we are not scaring anybody, you know. But what is going to happen? They're going to make it mandatory. Mm -hmm. And in order to make it mandatory, you have to impart, impose a law. Mm -hmm. Just like the mandatory vaccination policy. Mm -hmm. This is coming. So, you're self-employed, you're a worker. You need to get yourself unionized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's only the trade union is going to stand up and fight for you. Nobody else. Mm -hmm. Pastors in the church, they're coming at you because you're self-employed. Some people have their own church. You're right. working with yourself. Right. The, the, the DJs, <laughs> you're doing your own business, they're coming at you. In the 2023 budget presentation, Minister of Finance Camilla Gonzalez indicated that the government will be looking seriously at the issue of pension reform this year, which the SVGTU said it will be keeping a close eye on. But the thing is, we're hoping that they could, the NIS could really for, come out of whatever problems mm -hmm. they have been facing to bring them to this. Yeah. We have not heard up to now what has brought them to this. We know mm -hmm. the government keeps saying that they are paying so many more people for the non-contributory pension. You know, they're mm -hmm. paying so many pursuits and the money has been increased and so on. I don't think we could say the same for the NIS. Right. Because the NIS was supposed to be an independent body, body. set up just to do this. Precisely. So I think I agree with the caller who said that we need to hold them to account. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? To hold them to account to tell us how the money was spent and now that posters are getting older. But really and truly, I would love to see them come out of this. 
you know, without having to really put more pressure, pressure. on workers. Yeah. I think workers really can't be anymore. Oh, so they no, need to go back to the join board and look at more creative ways mm -hmm. of dealing with the issues mm -hmm. rather than coming and saying you're going to really up the age. Again, after putting people in so much distress with the age that they have opted. Some persons right now are home without a dollar, you know, mm. because they did not receive, they were, did not qualify. They were not qualified for non-contributory okay, pension. Okay, so yeah. they were depending on the NIS at age 60. Mm -hmm. And they're telling them they have to wait until 64 and they have to wait. How are people supposed to survive? Right. You know, right, so yeah. that is my concern. And Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez is leading SVG's delegation in Argentina for the historic meeting of Latin American Caribbean leaders. The other members of SVG's delegation are Minister of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Trade, Kiesel Peters, SVG's Ambassador to Venezuela, His Excellency Garrett Bino, SVG's former Ambassador to Venezuela, Andreas Wickham, and the Prime Minister's Security, Kendall Horn. The seventh summit of the Community of Latin American Caribbean states opened today with host President Alberto Fernandez calling for unity and respect and on countries in CELAC to work together. Speaking through an interpreter, President Fernandez highlighted the challenges of countries of Latin America and the Caribbean. He says during a meeting with Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley, he was given further insight into the plight of islands of the Caribbean. At all fora I attended, I took the voice of the Caribbean calling for climate change to be considered. And this is a matter I raised at the uh, G20, where Argentina is a member. I also raised this matter in France and at the G7 when we talked about how the effects of climate negatively impacted such an important part of the world which provides so much enjoyment to millions of people around the world due to the natural beauty of the Caribbean and which also poses so many problems to the locals. So as president of CELAC, my first visit was to Barbados. CELAC leaders are expected to deliberate on a range of issues, including the fight against the extreme right and the face of democratic processes in different countries, the U.S. blockade of the countries of the region, and the need for economic independence, among others. St. Vincent and the Grandines is vying for the presidency of the 33-member CELAC organization for 2023. The IAEA is currently on the ground to conduct a week-long training session with 35 radiation protection officers from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Belize, Dominica, Grenada, Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, and St. Lucia. The original training session for officers are organized and spearheaded by the IAE's Radiation Transport and Way Safety Division. The aim of the training session is to provide participants of member states with an introduction to radiation protection standards and procedures and diagnostic and international radiology facilities. According to a news release, the training will include uh, but not be limited to the protection of patients, quality management, regulatory oversight, the safe transport of radioactive material and radioactive waste management. The IAEA organizes about 25 specialized training courses per year. <laughs> We hear that an initiative that will assist in the development of home gardening in St. Vincent and the Grenadines will kickstart soon. The Home Garden Initiative is a collaborative initiative between the Ministry of Agriculture and the Association of Evangelical Churches in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The initiative, which is a post-volcanic response, will also help to support youth in agriculture. Speaking at the launch of the initiative, Deputy Chief Agricultural Officer Colville King said that the ministry continues to promote and develop initiatives aimed at ensuring food security. We regain, rebuild the level of food security that we had post-volcanic eruption. Uh, we're ensuring as well that we continue to promote initiatives and opportunities for women and youth. And in particular, we have supported five youth in agriculture groups that we, ha we were working with in 2021 and we build on that and 
we are also ensuring that we are delivering a level of training to ensure that this initiative would be sustainable. Uh, so the ministry at this point would like to thank the Giving Hands uh, group in Germany and the Association of Evangelical Churches in St. Vincent and the Grenadines uh, for the support to this initiative, uh, to, to support an ongoing initiative that aid us in reaching additional stakeholders, additional beneficiaries. President of the Association of Evangelical Churches, SVG, Dr. Renal Murray, said that being part of the Home Gardening Initiative is part of their post-volcanic response. We wanted to find a way how we can help people with food. So I wrote this proposal relating to developing home gardens and feeding as many people as we can. Then I went to a function at the Methodist Church Hall and heard Mr. King talking about the home garden project that the Ministry of Agriculture was doing. And I felt, well, hey, it's, it's very much in line, exactly what we're trying to do. So why try to do this alone when I could maximize the impact by teaming up with an established entity, more so a government entity. So we decided to merge our little funds with the work of the Ministry of Agriculture et al. And through those, we have been establishing this program. I'm very pleased with the design of the program and the work that is set out by uh, Mr. King and his team, Ms. Thompson and others. Uh, I've attended a number of meetings with the ministry and very satisfied that what they're doing is in line with what the funds were given for. So I've already reported to the agencies what we're doing with the funds and they're looking forward for continued um, involvement. What we really, really want to do is not just to feed people physically, but to feed them spiritually as well. So the association is totally involved in the life of Vincentians. And this is just one aspect of the way in which we're able to make an impact in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So look forward to seeing the project become reality and actually seeing some food being produced as a result of this effort. Senior Technical Officer in the Rural Transformation Unit of the Ministry of Agriculture, Carl Thompson Fergus, said that the initiative will target 75 home gardeners or households and five youth groups. Those five youth groups are in Chatibele, Leyo, New Grounds, Beckway, and Bayabo. But we anticipate that we would have application for the program across St. Vincent and the Grenadines. But, uh, it would be nice, it would be really good to have persons from those five areas applying because um, we could see the synergies between what has been going on with the five groups before and what is happening. We are going to support gardens no greater than 4,000 square feet. So if you have a whole big farm, we will not you would not be qualified under this program because this is a home garden program. 4,000 square feet, what we support. Granted that if you have a larger plot of land that is greater than 4,000 square feet and still want to be part, we would only support 4,000 square feet, maximum. And we would, that when we say 4,000 square feet, it means that we can support up to. So persons who are interested but have smaller plots, they are also encouraged to apply. Speaking on the process of being part of the program, Thompson outlined different places where applications forms will be located. These application forms would be available um, in hard copy at all of our agriculture stations. Walilabu, Dongbatten, New Grounds, and to some extent some would be at Rivulet as well. There would be forms also at the Ministry of Agriculture, at the main office, and at Rural Transformation Unit. We also take advantage of the media of uh, Facebook. So the ministry has a Facebook page, the Ministry of Agriculture Facebook page, the form will be there as well. Forms completed in soft copy on, on the Facebook page can be emailed to rtugov at gmail.com or at office.agriculture at mail.gov.vc so that we recognize that some persons may not be able to take advantage of any of those. They'll feel free to call the ministry. And we can take the application uh, 
online, but they will have to make some sort of an arrangement to have it signed. So they can call for more information as well, 457-1812 or 457-1414 or 456-1410. Plans are said to be progressing to transform the Calico uh, Clinic into a full polyclinic, which rehabilitation work to take place on other health facilities across the country. This is according to Era Representative and Minister of Finance, Camilla Gonzalez, on the API's Morning SVG program recently, said given the growing population of the communities which the Calico Clinic provides service to, as it now stands, the clinic cannot continue to manage the volume of people and hence the facility has to be upgraded. Which means we're going to essentially, we thought we could build up uh, there, but the engineer says it's, it's going to be better to just knock that building down and build a whole new clinic there. So it's going to, instead of travel, it, instead of going from the road backwards, it's going to sort of run alongside the road. Um, beautiful design, top class clinic. Uh, the designs are being completed now. That one's going to be a polyclinic. The, the clinic in South Rivers is going to be upgraded to a polyclinic. There's going to be work on the clinic in uh, Bel Air. There's going to be work on a clinic in Byra. Uh, there's going to be work on a clinic in Greggs and Cedars. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a few, but, but there's a lot of work is going to be done on making sure that if you have a small problem, yeah, if you have a small challenge, um, you don't need to go to a hospital. You can go get those matters dealt with in the clinics. Interestingly, in Enams, where there's a clinic, when you have the Calico Polyclinic and then you have the clinic out in Stubbs, um, the, the Enams clinic won't be getting the kind of urgent care attention uh, activity that it normally gets. So we're converting that clinic into a wellness center to deal with people who have chronic ailments related to diabetes and other non-communicable diseases. It's going to have an area where we're going to teach people uh, nutrition, how to cook food that tastes good but it won't kill you. Um, we're going to have areas to deal with exercising and fitness um, and, and diabetic ulcer care and these sorts of things. So the Enems Clinic is going to be converted to a wellness center. On the road repair program to be undertaken this year, Minister Gonzalez said the government will have a lot more control over the process, including the selection of roads to be worked on. We are managing it. It's going to be um, the a Taiwanese company, the OECC, is going to be doing a lot of the work in a supervisory capacity, but they're going to be subcontracting to local people who understand things on the ground and understand how these things work. So we expect to do... Um, a fair amount of work this year and even more work next year and the year after. In addition to that program, um, we looked at a lot of the other road programs that have been in the budget for years and have sort of been stagnating. That, oh yeah, we have some money to do that road, but there's a problem and there's this problem and that problem. And last year in 2022, we spent a lot of time reforming all of those processes. So we had some roads that were going to be done by the Caribbean Development Bank that had sort of stalled. We tore up our arrangements and started from scratch. Those roads are all going to begin within the next couple of months because we have a new team in place, new engineers, new consultants, um, um, new contractors, and that work is going to begin very soon. The $27 million worth of work is going to be done very soon. Then we have other little programs here and there that were slated to fix this or that road. We've brought all of them together sort of under a central management scheme. And this year, in addition to that 27, we're going to spend another $23 million in other roads. So this year, $50 million worth of road work will be done. In other local news, we heard that the SVG Jump Foundation, which started in September 2013, is celebrating its 10th anniversary of existence. It took a conference which culminated on Sunday at the Girls' Guides headquarters was staged by the members as part of its anniversary celebration. Executive elections were also initiated, with Saul Victor Byron remaining as president. The vice president is Sulian Joseph, treasurer Zander Rogers, secretary James McDonnell, and public relations officer William Antony. Speaking at the conference, president of the SVG Jam Foundation, Victor Byron expressed gratitude to all who have been helping the foundation, especially the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which provides $25,000 through the National Lodges Authority for capacity building. The 10-year 
journey in this organization was not, it was not an easy road, but we survived. Right? I want to take this opportunity to thank the government and the cabinet for its timely intervention by securing or providing through the National Lottery a grant of $25,000 to the organization for capacity building. We want to give the assurance that this money will be put to good use and it will be properly accounted for. Further highlighting some of the achievements made by the organization during its 10 years, Abira noted though it was challenging, they were able to do positive things. Now the first two years of the, the organization, we conducted drum circles in several parts of the island. We had, for three years, we conducted August vocational training sessions for young people for three years. Now, these two activities had to be curtailed because of lack of funds. Because um, I don't know what's the reason, but um, the Jump Foundation and organization, these, I don't know, the business sector, maybe are reluctant to really um, fund our organization, the, like these. Not our own, but these types of um, traditional organizations. But they, I, I wouldn't um, blame them for that. I don't know what the reason. So I just saying that. Now, um, the, okay, this, 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 these two arm activities were discontinued because of lack of funds. In 2014, um, we secured funds from the GEF, GEF funding agency to do a climate change and adaptation project along with AMP, the Association of Music um, Professionals. Um, this um, project came out of the flood in 2013 where we had the flash floods and lots of bridges and people houses were washed and so on. So we recognized that um, it was that there was a need to educate people about climate change and climate adaptation. So in that project we had nine jump circles Three Vincentian students pursuing studies at the University of the West Indies Open Campus here are recipients of the Evans Bernard John Memorial Bursary Award. The bursaries were sponsored by the Lions Club South SVG, partnering with the SVG Toronto Support Group. The three recipients are Dwayne Frederick, Diana Nero, and Deborah Scorpio, all pursuing studies in public relations management. Each recipient was awarded $2,000. A news release from the Agency for Public Information said in a ceremony at a UWI Open Campus Conference Room on Monday, January 23rd, a representative of the SVG Toronto Support Group, Osmond Davey, said the late E.B. John was the foundation member of the SVG Toronto Support Group struggle to get the organization off the ground. Davey said he is pleased to see that the organization is now bearing fruits. Davey also mentioned that the SVG Toronto Support Group also contributed to relief efforts during La Sofre eruption and to other organizations here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Head of the, the UWI Open Campus site, Deborah Dalrymple, said the three awardees are students who are well deserving of the award. The presentation of the award is the second of its kind, and Dalrymple assured the gathering that a third is likely. 